Our next speaker is the Director of Research in the Physical Sciences uh, at the University of Washington's eScience Institute, where his research is primarily in the area of data-driven astronomy and astrophysics. He is also incredibly famous and well-known for being a maintainer and contributor to many open source Python projects, including uh, SCI Kit Learn, SCI Pi, uh, MLD, uh, MPLD3, and others. Uh, please welcome Jake Vanderplatz. Thanks. Um, it's, it's really great to be here. As, uh, as you said, I'm, uh, I'm at University of Washington. I'm an astronomer by, by training. And um, I find my, I've found myself in the last six months or so doing a, a bit of visualization stuff, which I'll tell you about. But today I'm going to be talking about the, a really, really nice um, open source tool called the IPython Notebook, which, um, you know, I'm, I'm used to speaking to crowds where everyone knows this and uses this all the time. So can I just get a show of hands for how many people actually use the IPython Notebook? OK, so we've got a, maybe a third of the room is familiar with this and uses it. That's, that's good. Um, I'm going to tell you why the rest of you guys should all start using this right now. So um, just as a talk outline, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of talk about the, uh, the IPython notebook itself for a little while, um, why I think it's important and why I think all of you should be using it. Um, then I'm going to go a little bit into the, um, the current world of Python visualization and uh, talk about that a bit. And then um, these IPython 2.0 was released just a few weeks ago and it includes this new feature called uh, the interactive, uh, the, the widgets. And this is a kind, of a kind of a cool way to bring some interaction to your data visualizations. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about all, all those things, but we'll start out with just uh, something about the notebook itself. So, um, I say IPython Notebook is visualization in context. So uh, I want to start out by showing you something that, you know, we, we've seen this sort of plot before. The, this is the type of plot that's easy to uh, pick on, right? It's a USA Today graphic. I'm ho I hope there are no USA Today people. Um, but the, uh, you know, basically when, when a graphic lacks context, when we, when we lack where the, the zero is on the y-axis, it can be, it can be um, misleading. And you know, there are all sorts of examples on this. I'm on my Facebook and my Twitter, these sorts of things come across all the time. I guess triangles are, are you know, people are, can really naturally tell the, the area of triangles and compare them in their mind. So this is a great way to visualize, um, <laughs> visualize revenues and comparisons. But you know, we could, these are kind of cheap jabs, right? We could sit here and, and um, pick apart little graphics like that all day. But I'm going to um, do something right now. I'm going to pick apart something that's a little, a little more subtle. So um, this is something that was published just a couple weeks ago on uh, 538 blog. I'm not going to pick on them too much, because I think they do, they do awesome work. Um, but this is, this is talking about the Bechtel test, which is uh, a test of uh, basically looking for gender bias in movies. And it's a, it's a really simple test. It's really nice. The, the Bechtel test. Um, you have to meet some criteria. The, the film has to have at least two women. Those women must have names. Uh, the women must have a conversation at some point. Uh, that conversation has to be with each other. And it can't be talking about the men, right? <laughs> so this, is, this seems to be a really low bar to hit for movies, right? <laughs> but if you look at this, if, um, let me go back one. If you look at this, it's like even current day movies, it's barely 50% of them pass this Bechtel test, right? So. Um, what 538 did is they did this interesting thing where they explored the best Bechtel test and correlated it with the results as far as movie profits, right? And they found that actually, surprisingly, movies which pass the Bechtel test make more money than movies that don't. So, you know, I, I guess that's a good thing. We can be, we can be happy about that, that the, the films which don't display a gender bias are basically better received by the audiences. So um, th this whole thing is an interesting study, but you know, why do I bring this up in the same list with the Fox News bar plot, <laughs> right? Um, well, the thing is, there's, we, we don't know if there's anything wrong with this, right? We, um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say there's anything wrong with this visualization. But because we don't have access to the raw data, we can't, we can't say anything about that. We can't prove that to ourselves. You know, if someone is, someone is, is interested in exploring the deeper correlations in this, the, the data is not available. 
And um, this is exactly the point that a guy named Brian Keegan made in response to this article. Um, and he wrote this, uh, this post called The Need for Openness in Data Journalism. And what he said, uh, and I really resonate with this, is that journalists should subject themselves to the same reproducibility and openness standards as scientists. So we as scientists, I know we, we fail on this all the time, but we are, we are doing our best to make sure that the data we're using, the, the processing we're using, the code we're writing is all available so that people can reproduce our results. And Keegan echoes something that I think a lot of us have felt from 538 and other data-centric news outlets, that this new brand of data journalism is disappointing in some senses because it's trying to do science without any of that peer review that, um, that keeps people you know, uh, to abide by the scientific norms. So um, this article was really nice. And you know, he wasn't just sitting there and complaining. Um, he actually wrote a response to this, and this is awesome. You can go to this, uh, go to his site, and he wrote an IPython notebook that um, summarizes all this. And then he actually goes and um, he says, "Start your kernels." You know, IPython notebook allows you to do some parallel data processing. He goes and he finds the data. He gives you scripts to download it. He analyzes it. He produces the results. You know, it's just this this huge long thing. That's, um, I mean. There's no way I could even talk about all this. But he has, he has all, all that stuff in there that just shows you um, exactly what's happening in this. And fortunately, he, um, he, confirms, what, uh, he confirms what 538 was, was saying. So there were some subtleties that um, you know, he disagreed on. But basically, the overall message was correct. So that's good. That's encouraging. But um, you know, he shouldn't have to go out there and dig out all that data himself. And to their credit, um, I lost one thing. Where would it? Oh, well. Yeah, so to their credit, anyway, um, 538 responded and um, put, put their data on GitHub. So now you can go to their GitHub page. You can download the data. You can download their scripts that do these things. And um, the hope would be that you know, they learn from this and, and uh, do that from the beginning next time, especially when they're talking about things like elections and climate change and stuff that people really get, you know, get argumentative about. It's, it's important to have the data out there. So I showed you that example of the IPython notebook. And um, I, I called this IPython notebook putting visualization in context. And that's really what this does. It, it allows you, the IPython notebook allows you to put explanation, code, data, visualizations, and much more all in one place. So for example, um, right here, you can, this is an IPython notebook. You can click here and see that it, this is just uh, written in Markdown. Um, and you know it renders in the browser. You can put in code, and you can actually execute the code here. This is just a Python script that computes the Fibonacci numbers and then prints a whole bunch of them. Um, you can do things like write paragraphs of text. You can use uh, markup to do mathematical equations if you're if you're into that kind of thing. Um, you can you know write lists. You can embed static figures like we saw above. So it's really a powerful tool to to put all these different media sources together. And um, I showed earlier, you can even embed iframes with other web pages. Um, and more importantly, you can, actually, um, you can actually put code that generates uh, figures dynamically in here. So let's say I want to you know, put 1,000 points instead of 100 points. Um, I can add a lot more to the plot. So this, this is a, an executable document where a, a reader can download this and tweak the numbers and see what happens. Right? It's no longer just static data visualization or a static web page. And um, the core visualization tool is this, uh, this matplotlib tool. And you can actually, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and open this. Um, you can open the matplotlib gallery, and there's just you know, a ton, ton of different graph types that are in here. I'll talk a little bit more about those um, later. But you can do things like uh, load one of these examples. This is just copied from the website. And once we load that and uh, run it down here, you get you know, various visualizations. So it's, it's an easy way to explore um, how to do all these things if you don't really, if you don't really have, the, have the chops to do it from scratch. There are a lot of resources out there. Um, the other thing is uh, notebooks can be shared online. And this has been really, really important. There's a site called nbviewer, notebookviewer.ipython.org. Um, and it basically takes any IPython notebook. It's a notebook is just a JSON format. And it's, um, 
You can save it on GitHub. You can put it anywhere you want. NB Viewer allows you to, to render those basically on the cloud and share them with anyone. So if you go to the NB Viewer site, there's all sorts of stuff. There's different programming languages. There's whole textbooks that have been written in IPython notebooks. So these are executable textbooks, which is super cool. Um, there's all sorts of other things in there. Um, and um, people are doing other things, too, like, for example, blogging. I, I write this blog called Pythonic Perambulations, because I like to think about Python a lot. And almost all of my blog posts are written in IPython notebooks. So this is one about understanding the fast Fourier transform. You know, there's math in there, there's code, there's, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. And it's an, it's an executable document, so if anyone's cur curious about it, they can download the notebook that's the source of the blog post and go from there. It's, Really a cool format. And you know, of course, notebooks can even be viewed as slideshows. So that's what I'm using right here for the, the IPython notebook slideshow. Um, so anyway, what is IPython? The, the summary here is that IPython is it's tools for the entire life cycle of a scientific idea. It's, it's a, a tool that helps you with exploration, that helps you with collaboration and sharing of your, your data. It helps you with uh, publication and um, reproduction of results. So any, any of the research that I do now in my, in my astronomy research, I tend to you know, write up summaries in IPython notebooks and share them with people. And um, it's, it's a way to really kind of make the scientific process more dynamic and more streamlined. Um, and there are all sorts of other things. There, yeah, uh, Skipper Siebold, he's a, a stats guy who um, did basically re-ran 538 famous 2012 election coverage in an IPython notebook, so you can find that there. And there's this whole gallery of interesting IPython notebooks um, that you can find online. So there's, there's a ton of stuff out there that people have done with this. Um, the IPython architecture is something really interesting. You basically have, um, when you launch this notebook, you have this kernel running on your system, and that's running the Python or running, kind of running the code. And then that kernel has to, um, has to interact and interface with your web browser. Because the notebook is a, is a browser-based interface. I'm just using my you know, Google Chrome right now. And that happens via, via the zero MQ messaging protocol. But the, the cool thing about this is that it, it leaves a lot of flexibility. So for example, the, right now I'm running a Python kernel for my IPython notebook. But there are kernels available in, any other, in, in many other languages, you know, Julia, R, uh, Erlang, I have a, a whole list of it somewhere. The other cool thing is that the client is browser-based, and we know in here how powerful the browser is. You know, lot, lots of people focus a lot of time on getting interesting visualizations in the browser. So it means that you can do things like um, define some Python code that creates some JavaScript. So here's a little Python script that um, creates an interactive widget and it allows us to visualize factors. So I'm going to go to 72, because 72 has a lot of factors. And what this is doing is it's, it's calculating the factors in Python, sending it to uh, the browser, and then rendering um, using D3, rendering, rendering the results. So this means that you can really start tying together, um, you can tie together all sorts of languages, all sorts of different tools in, in one place. And I, I want to show you a brief example of that. Um, you might have heard of the Julia programming language. This is a new language out of MIT that a lot of folks are really excited about because it sort of combines the best of both worlds of compiled languages and dynamic languages. Um, but IPython allows you to do this thing called the Julia magic. So basically, you um, use these percent signs, and these, these denote magic functions. So this is going to, this is going to call in Julia um, it's going to import some Python packages in Julia after starting the Ju Julia kernel. And then we put this 2% Julia, and this says all the code down here is actually Julia code, not Python code. So this is, if you know the Julia language, this is the Julia format for defining uh, an array, defining the sign of that array. And then we're going to do this strange thing where we actually call the Python plotting library in Julia and plot the Julia variables and then um, I think I'm just going to execute all this because it's fun to see. Um, you plot all the Julia variables, and then it returns the Julia, the, the Python, Julia version of the Python figure to Python, and which then renders it in JavaScript. So you have, you know, it's really simple. It's, uh, it's easy for anyone to understand. 
Um, and, and there's kind of other cool things too. So this is this uh, Julia figure that we created. We can now pull that out of Julia and work with it in Python. So now I've, I've, I have that figure object that was created in Julia. And um, you, know, you, you can really start to do some crazy things. This is one of my favorite examples. This is a, a dual recursive algorithm for the Fibonacci numbers where the Julia version calls the Python version, and the Python version calls the Julia version. And you go back and forth until you've computed you know, the sixth Fibonacci number. And it's, um, you can see here that Julia is calling Python, and then we're passing this fib, which is the Julia version of that. So it, it's uh, multi-language uh, interoperability um, in the IPython notebook. So if, if you take anything from this talk, I want you to remember that IPython is not about Python. It's about <laughs> It's about much, much more. That's definitely where it started, but um, there's some great things going on with that. So if, you, um, if you're interested in other languages, these are the kernels that are currently available in IPython. of Julia, Haskell, F Sharp, Ruby, Go, Scala, all these other things that I honestly haven't heard of. Mathix, I don't even know what that is, but someone wrote a kernel. Um, so you, you, can, you can use this with, uh, with your own favorite language and, and make these sort of executable, reproducible documents. So um, let's switch gears a little bit now and go over and start talking about the modern world of Python visualization. Now, um, visualization in Python, um, it's, it sort of gets a bad rap. Um, and there's good reason for it to get a bad rap. You know, the matplotlib is a standard scientific visualization library. And it was written um, over the course of the last 15 or 18 years by a bunch of academics. Um, it was actually written, written by some of the same people that Rob uh, complained about who used the wrong color charts and, and think they're you know, doing great stuff. So you know, if, you do a, if you do a scatter plot, it, you know, it looks like this. And that's a, that's a fine scientific scatter plot. And, it's funny though, it kind of reminds me of, of Excel a little bit. And when I was first trying to convince people in, in UW Astronomy to switch to Python from this system called IDL, which is a proprietary language, um, I heard this a lot, like, hey, that looks a lot like Excel, you know, this derogatory thing. Um, yeah, Excel's, Excel's good. I would try not to make fun of it too much. Um, it's also horrible in terms of default color schemes. If you just pull out a color bar, you know, it's your, your favorite rainbow color scheme that we um, that are <laughs> railed against earlier today. Um, and there are things like the fact that it's not interactive. If you make this plot and you say, hey, I want to center on that circle right there, it's just a, an embedded PNG in the browser, right? You can't, you can't do any of this stuff by clicking and dragging. So these are all the weaknesses of matplotlib that people um, get annoyed with. But you know, it's true, with enough effort, you can do some pretty interesting visualizations. And this is something from a, a project I worked on where we're visualizing, um, this is made with matplotlib, and we're visualizing asteroids. And I want to take a brief aside and, and tell you about this, because I think it's pretty cool. Um, basically, on, on the left side, the left plot, we're plotting the optical color versus the infrared color. So this is kind of the observed colors of asteroids. And the, the way we chose the color of each of those individual points is just kind of an arbitrary uh, mapping of that, that space on the left plot. And then what we do is we take those same colors based on the, the location on the left plot and plot it on the right plot. And here we're plotting orbital dynamics. So the x-axis is the semi-major axis, basically the distance from the sun. The y-axis is the inclination, so how the orbit is inclined, right? And um, by using the same color scheme from the left plot, it allows us to see these relationships between four different dimensions. Um, and I, I like how this turns out, because what you can see here is that there are clumps in the orbital space that um, are all the same color. And these, this clump right here is all green. And what that says, um, those colors are basically correlated to the chemistry of the asteroids. So these clumps here, are in the same place in orbital space and dynamical space, but they're also chemically similar. And this is evidence that, that basically these asteroid families started out as a big asteroid, and then you know, two of them collided, and it turned into a whole bunch of little asteroids. So we can deduce that from this, uh, from this data right here. And this is in matplotlib. So you, 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 can, do, you can do decent stuff in matplotlib. Um, this is the code, actually, that generated that plot. So you can see that doing decent stuff in matplotlib takes a little bit of work. Um, you, have to, you have to add you know, a lot of, lot of stuff in there. And this is, um, 
Incidentally, I'm going to do a shameless plug. This is from our textbook. Uh, it's called Statistics, Data Mining, and Machine Learning in Astronomy. It came out in January, and we have this uh, AstroML website that basically uh, every single figure in the textbook you can, um, you can check out and click on and see the source code that generated it. So I'm pretty proud of that. It took a long time. <laughs> anyway. So if any of you are into like graduate level um, astrostatistics, this would be the book for you. I'd recommend it. Um, it's, it's selling like hotcakes. <laughs> um, so anyway, Matplotlib is old, it's static, it has crappy defaults. So why do we, why do we use it, right? Um, well, people are using it because it's a really well-established tool. It's really, really battle-tested. Um, it, it got a big boost back in the mid-90s from uh, the Space, Cel Space Telescope Science Institute, and they kind of threw a whole bunch of their postdocs behind it to make it really good. But uh, Matplotlib is, like most graphics frameworks, it has, I, I think of it as a three-component thing. It has an API, it has some abstraction of the, of the graphics, and then it has the output that might be PNG or PDF or web or whatever you want to do. And Matplotlib does all of these, right? It has, the, as, it has actually two different APIs you can use. It has this abstraction that's essentially a, you know, a Python abstraction of uh, support vector graph, or, uh, scalable vector graphics. Um, and the output, it can do all sorts of stuff. You know, scientists need PDFs, we need PNGs, we need SVGs, EPS, PS, because all the, um, all the journals just accept different things. And, you know, they say, we only take EPS and not PS. And so you need Matplotlib to do all that stuff. And there's all sorts of graphical um, GUI backends as well uh, for, for all different systems. So Matplotlib does all of this really well. Um, but there are other parts that it doesn't do well. You know, I showed you the API. And this is where, um, this is where a few add-ons, and just in the last like six months or a year, people have been um, doing a lot of interesting stuff with this. So at the API level, there are three projects in particular that I really like. There's a Seaborn one, which I'll show you, Pretty Plotlib and ggplot. Basically, they try to replace the Matplotlib API and um, uh, put in something that's a little more reasonable. And then they use all the rest of the Matplotlib architecture to do the rendering and everything like that. So uh, an example, Seaborn here. Um, this, is, this is by Michael Wascom, and a, he's a neuroscientist at Stanford. And essentially what it does is the, the goal of Seaborn, Seaborn is to do, um, is to do why isn't this working? Hmm. Oh, I know. That's not supposed to show anything. The goal of Seaborn is to do, uh, do really nice plots really tersely. So these are like statistical plots, things that you would do in, in statistical data mining and, and data exploration. And so, for, for example, there's this join plot right here that basically calls several hundred lines of the Matplotlib API, but, but gives, you a, gives you a nice wrapper to do a type of plot that you might want to do a lot. Um, it, it uses uh, nice color schemes. It you know, does things like compute kernel density estimation automatically. And um, like I said, this is using Matplotlib. It's using that battle-tested uh, battle core, but it's giving it a new API. Um, you know, and it uses good color schemes. I think this actually draws from Color, color Brewer and projects like that. So just to show you that, um, Matplotlib is not the, you know, if, if you hate the Matplotlib API, that shouldn't stop you from, from using this tool. And I'm, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over showing you uh, prettyplotlib and ggplot, which are kind of similar idea to that, but they're great projects. Uh, one that I've worked on a little bit is this um, MPLD3 project. Um, and if I click over here, yeah, so this is, this is uh, just a, a quick demo of MPLD3. So what MPLD3 does is it takes matplotlib, MPL graphics, and converts them to D3. And it's, it's pretty fun. I showed you a little while ago that you know, the, the output of these plots are basically static plots, right? This is a PNG. I can't do anything interactive here. But if you call a little co piece of code here that I wrote, the MPLD3 enable notebook, and show the figure, then all of a sudden you get a, a figure that's uh, dynamic. And you can zoom around and scale and um, you know, click home and, and explore, things, uh, explore things more dynamically in the notebook. And um, what this is actually doing, it's kind of, it started out as a, as a hack and turned into a gigantic hack. Um, <laughs> and it, it uses this package called MPL Exporter to basically scrape the Matplotlib object, 
um, construct a JSON that's, uh, that's similar in spirit to projects like Vega, but there, there are a couple reasons I didn't just use Vega. Um, so it has a JSON that basically tells you everything that's in the plot. And then uh, once it has that, it um, sends it to this uh, JavaScript library that's about 1,500 lines of JavaScript. And um, you know, this, is, this is where I realized that you know, the, there, there are scientific Python users who, who spend all day, they like Python so much that they spend all day you know, writing Python and debugging Python. And then there are the scientific Python developers who love Python so much that they spend all day writing JavaScript. <laughs> um, so that's, that's what I've been doing with my last few months, <laughs> debugging JavaScript, oh boy. Um, yeah, and, and it produces this pure client-side view. So you can, essentially, um, you can essentially embed this in web pages. You can share your data that way. You can let people interact. You know, it's just D3 in the browser. Um, the other th cool thing is that, uh, that I added is this ability to add plugins. So you can do something like this tooltip plugin and you connect that to the figure, and then all of a sudden when you hover over points, it tells you what those points are. You know, these aren't very helpful labels. They're just point zero through point 100. But you, know, you, can, you can put in whatever labels you want. This is just a list of strings for those labels. Uh, we can do things uh, a little more sophisticated. So here's a big uh, Python script to just generate a grid of plots. And then down here, we just connect a linked brush plugin. And uh, you can probably guess what's going to happen. If you, um, if you then brush on the points, you can explore and see the, see the relationship between all the different dimensions. So that's pretty fun. And you can even, if, you, if you're really masochistic, you can start writing your own plugins. And um, it's, it's basically a bit of Python plus a bit of JavaScript. And the JavaScript is defined in a string in the Python. And then, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I told you, massive hack. And then um, you connect it to the figure, and it, and it renders it, and it actually puts that JavaScript in there. So this is a custom plugin to make lines highlight as you go over them. And it's, it's more a proof of concept than anything, just to show you what's possible with this. So all of a sudden, you can start using um, your, you can start using your matplotlib plots interactively. Here's another silly one I did that's just like exploring SVG paths. So you can, you can click and drag the path, and it'll, you know funny things like that. Anyway, so that, that's MPLD3. If you want to see more, there's that website right there. I just released uh, a new version about five days ago in, to, to get it ready for this conference. And I'm pretty excited about it. There's a lot of good work going on. Um, and I think it's, it's paving the way for some interesting things. Um, the other thing, um, the other projects that are out there for visualization uh, actually sidestep Matplotlib altogether. There's this Bokeh project. There's Vincent Bearcart Plotly. I have links to all those. I'm going to um, skip showing you examples of those because I, I want, in the last few minutes, I want to get to the IPython interactive stuff. So this is the new stuff in the IPython notebook that actually allows you to, to, do, to interact with the kernel via JavaScript. So um, this is pretty cool stuff. Um, like I said, this is about three or four weeks old. I think I first saw this, uh, the prototype demoed um, maybe at the end of last fall by one of the IPython core folks. Um, so basically, the, uh, we, we've heard this week that the, the process of visualization is kind of an iterative thing, right? We heard from some of the speakers yesterday that you know, Despite what we might think, they're, they, they don't feel like they're you know, amazing geniuses. And they actually have to sit there and try things and, and do different stuff and eventually arrive where they want. And the notebook, um, what, what the interactive visualization, the, the interactive widgets try to do is, is put that process in the notebook a little more seamlessly. So for example, let's say I have some uh, data here. And I have a function that draws a scatter plot. And this is the result. And you know, I'm, I'm not very happy with that because you know, points are too small, the, the default color scheme is ugly, you know, stuff like that. So what we can do is use this interact framework, and it's just a couple lines, right? We, do, we import interact from IPython, then we call interact on this draw scatter function, and we give it a bunch of values that we want ranges for. And now all of a sudden we have these JavaScript widgets that when you move them, they're calling back into Python. So this is calling from the browser into your Python kernel, regenerating this plot. And um, we can actually explore here that you know, there are, there are some, some nice-ish color maps in here. Some, the, the cube helix one is one that I like a lot. 
because that, that's the one that's spiral, spiraling through space while, uh, while incrementing the brightness, basically. And you know, we, we might want to make this a little uh, you know, transparent. So this is the kind of stuff that you know, uh, uh, two months ago you would have to do by actually editing by hand the values in the code. And now we have these nice interactive sliders to do that, um, do that process quickly. And we can do a lot of stuff with this. Like here's an example of uh, a bit of code that generates some random graphs using the network X library. And then we can explore what these random graphs look like as you adjust the parameters that, um, that are used to create them. And I honestly don't know much about this, so it's just like clicking buttons and you know, sometimes stuff looks cool. But um, <laughs> the guy who wrote this uh, knows a lot about graphs, <laughs> which you would hope. <laughs> Um, and this is one that, that I did that I, I really like. This is exploring the Lorenz system. So the Lorenz system is a system of differential equations that have really interesting solutions depending on, um, depending on how you set the parameters. So this is, a, this is actually code that solves the, the Lorenz system, the differential equation. See, so we just define the derivative here. And then we actually use wherever it is we... Uh, Where's the solution happening? Oh yeah, here it is. We're doing the ordinary differential equation integration to find the solution, then plotting it. And if we call solve Lorenz right here, we get this nice little static view of what the Lorenz system paths look like. Um, we can do the same thing with the interactive, and now all of a sudden it gets uh, interesting. We can adjust the angle and see in 3D what's going on, right? We can see the effect of sigma on the paths. You know, what, is, what does sigma do to this? What does the beta variable do to this? And each time I move one of these things, it's actually in real time calling back to Python, resolving all the, the paths, resolving the differential equation, plotting them, and then um, showing, it, showing it here. So we're, I'm working with some grad students at UW right now who are basically using this to develop a series of notebooks to teach applied math. Um, so there's a, there's a professor named Randy Levesque, who some, some of you might know, and he, um, he teaches a, a lot of intro applied math stuff, and his, his grad students um, are, are working with the two of us to develop these sorts of tools to help, help students learn about this stuff. The same sort of thing we saw yesterday with the D3 visualizations. When you, when you can start interacting with things, when you can start seeing it dy dynamically, then, um, then learning really, really takes a leap. So, um, so that's, the, that's the end of the talk I outlined. And just in conclusion, I want to I kind of hammer down these, these couple points. I think the IPython notebook is, a, is an incredible, incredibly powerful platform to accomplish the types of things we want to do in science. And I would say the types of the things that, um, that you folks want to do in journalism, those, are, those of you who are working in media. I think this, this push towards open data, towards reproducibility, towards uh, dynamic documents like the IPython notebook is really, really important. Um, IPython gives you access to the code, to the data, to the visualizations and everything in context. Um, it allows you to reproduce analyses, analyses and graphics um, kind of in real time or at your leisure. The user can go back and download the document and, and do the analysis themselves. Um, it's multi-language, so this back end, these, these kernel back ends allow you to work in whatever you're comfortable in. I even heard rumors that someone's doing a MATLAB back end. I don't, I don't know if that excites anyone in here, but <laughs> you know, in, the, in the right audience, there would be cheers. Um, <laughs> and it has this browser front end that really the, the possibilities are limitless. You know, anything, anything you guys are doing in the browser, you could uh, write a Python script, a uh, meta script to generate that code and uh, make it happen, make it reproducible. And not that you'd want to do that necessarily, but, um, but you know, there, there's some interesting possibilities for that. So anyway, openness and reproducibility, it's a hallmark of good science, journalism, and visualization. And um, I hope that I've convinced all of you that you should use the IPython notebook in the future. So you can find my contact information there. And uh, thanks very much. <laughs>